So we designed all the content to expose these microphones to different conditions in terms of level, in terms of frequency, in terms of dynamics and transients that would really tell the full story and give, give any user a picture of what it would be like to own these microphones themselves. Purchasing audio equipment could be something of a minefield. Audio Test Kitchen took on the mammoth challenge of recording equipment in a perfectly repeatable manner. We met up with them in Chris Lord Alge's studio to talk through the process, the highs and lows, and what they plan for the future. Everything that Audio Test Kitchen does is about creating content and exposing these microphones to different conditions that will fully tell the story of what these microphones can do. So that means we had to have sources that were very low, you know, like a 26 inch bass drum tuned to 36 Hertz, a hi-hat with, you know, overtones stacking up, you know, past the human hearing range. Same thing with a tambourine. Now a tambourine has, has quite a lot of transient information, a uh, bass drum, a high SPL, um, and we chose two um, uh, miking positions in front of the bass drum, one quite close and one more as a room mic position. We realized when considering, you know, okay, what are the main functions and applications of large diaphragm condenser microphones? Some of them are directional cardioid patterns. Some of them, you know, are variable pattern, multi-pattern, you know, omni, figure eight, everything in between. Let's just stick with one pattern. And it's also the main use case, cardioid. So we just went with, let's put all these microphones in cardioid mode, uh, and oftentimes uh, some of these microphones are designed as fixed cardioid anyway. So we, we committed to that. Fundamental to doing any good comparisons of any audio gear, when you're interested in comparing you know, this piece of gear versus that one, and in our case, large diaphragm condenser microphones, is that everything in the signal chain must be exactly matched. So of course we matched um, the sources and kept those totally consistent. But then you have to look at, okay, well, what's between that source and the, the final recording. So that meant very, very closely controlling the positioning of the microphone. So we came up with a dual axis laser alignment, laser positioning system to guarantee that every diaphragm, every microphone diaphragm was in the exact same position in space, you know, up, down, forward, back, and, and twist. Um, and the cable was always identical. For example, we chose the Grace preamp because it's, um, I would call it the, the Switzerland of, of mic preamps. You know, uh, it's widely accepted as being totally neutral and transparent to the source. And that, so we looked at every step in the signal chain to make sure that um, there's no variation there. And of course, key to making any kind of audio comparison is level. You know, oftentimes, if there's even a tenth of a dB difference from one source to the next, the human ear is going to gravitate towards the one that's louder and think that it's better. Um, so we had a two-stage level matching process. Um, at every recording station, we had um, a, a loudspeaker set up uh, generating some test tones that we designed specifically to uh, eliminate, to, to um, ignore- Level calibrate, yeah. Yeah, to calibrate the, the microphone levels, mm -hmm. ignore proximity effect. Um, so that was stage one. And so we matched the levels within a, a decibel. And then at the very end of the day, um, uh, in our, in our post-production process, um, and I should say that anything you hear on Audio Test Kitchen that's an individual source is pretty much directly, there's been no change from the moment it was recorded and captured in the studio to how it's presented on the website other than this level matching and just trimming out, you know, any noise that it might've been at the beginning and end of the file. So it's gone from a 32-bit 96 kilohertz file to, um, you know, through a conversion stage to basically a, a high resolution MP3 on our site with, with no change other than that, this final level matching stage using a piece of software called Myriad that gets it within that tenth of a dB margin. If, if you look at what it's like right now as a musician, audio creator to shop for gear, or consider what gear you ought to buy or, or, or maybe go into use for your next session. Um, it's a little bit like if you were to go shopping on Amazon and on that day, there are no product images available. You can't see a picture of what you want to buy. And furthermore, you can't open another tab and compare that product to another product in the same category. Well, that's what it's like every day for musicians and recording artists and audio creators. They can't hear the sound of these products. So Audio Test Kitchen's big vision is to create a world in which you can hear and experience one of the, the most fundamental, important characteristic or quality of that gear.
the sound. I think the most obvious problem is trying to manage all the variables. And among the many variables when you're using microphones, that's probably the most obvious is performance variables. Um, so the, wor the thing you want to avoid most is <clears throat> uh, inconsistencies in performance being attributed falsely to, to microphones, because sometimes uh, the differences between a couple of microphones, in this case, what we started with large diaphragm condenser microphones, can be really subtle. Um, sometimes they're not, but when they are really subtle, if there's any differences in performance, say a, you know, a, a performer uses a little bit more of a plosive here and less the next time, sings a little bit louder, the listener is invariably going to not understand that that's a, that's a performance difference is going to think that difference is uh, attributable to the microphone. And, that, um, and that's just simply not, not something we could do. So we really needed to spend a lot of time to figure out uh, you know, what's the best way to capture all these microphones and to put them in real world situations, um, but also to manage um, a whole host of variables. But uh, probably the first one, if you just look at the signal chain, is really the performance itself needs to be identical. When Audio Test Kitchen set about to make products, audio products comparable online, we had to, uh, you know, and these are products used to create art generally, you know, music and, and audio. We actually had to turn to science to um, ensure that the thing on test, which is just that product, was the only variable in the comparison. So you're comparing two mics. The only difference that you'll hear, the important thing is, just the differences between those mics, their performance, not the performance of a human being or the difference in drum tuning or the difference in, you know, the tuning of a piano. So Audio Test Kitchen went to great lengths to very, very intentionally design the content and to design our, our capture and our production methodologies, everything from anechoic chambers and laser uh, diaphragm alignment keeping source consistency to make sure that ultimately when you're comparing gear on audio test kitchen the only difference you hear is between that gear itself so ian and i have both been engineers and producers and and uh, ian's uh, composer and, and and writer and um so for years we've been either recording vocals ourselves or producing vocal performances and the microphones um the large diaphragm condenser microphones which is the first category audio test kitchen started with those are one of the most compelling and um, uh, um, common or, or frequent applications for a large diaphragm condenser mic. So from our experience with vocals, we realized that it was gonna be super important to make sure that the sound of the vocals um, going, the sound that we get going into each microphone um, was exactly as a human would do it. So, but then how do we get it so that the performance is identical, you know, 250 times in a row. So my engineer skeptical brain just didn't think that the, there was any way to solve this problem other than to get some of the world's best singers and have them sing precisely the same every time at the exact same distance, the same part into all 250 mics. And I imagine these impossible sessions were like, okay, we're going to get this person for a week and we're going to have them, you know, sleep you know, I go to bed at the exact same time every day and then drink the exact same lemon tea at the exact same interval to create this consistency. Um, and we actually did some R&D um, year, a year before we went in and actually solved the problem of how to keep vocals consistent. And all the techniques that we tried, including stacks of mutt lang vocals, you know, 10 takes at a time into every different mic to, to, to um, smear out any performance differences. Well, none of that worked. And so then we had to, uh, th then what do we do? Because we, uh, my, skept my engineering brain skepticism didn't allow me to think that anything other than a human performance into these, these large diaphragm condenser microphones would work. Right. So then once again, we turn to science. Science. Our friends. Yeah, so that's right. The, the basic you know, choice was, hey, you either figure out a way to manage these, this you know the, this this variable which might be unmanageable in terms of vocal performance or your other your other option is to really find a way to reamp and we were from the 
get-go really skeptical about whether reamping vocals, basically capturing a, a single performance and then replaying that performance through some sort of um, through some sort of transducer in an environment so that the performance is the same each time, we were skeptical about that whether that could really be utilized. Um, but pretty early on, when we started our conversations with manufacturers, we figured out that that very process is what was uh, the reamp process was used by some of the best manufacturers in the in the world in order to really kind of solve a similar problem, which is how do we test our capsules and different variables and design, you know, with you know with 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 a source that's r truly consistent. Pretty early on, even under kind of scrappy, you know, just DIY uh, conditions testing this, um, we found out you know, much to our surprise that it was actually, we were able, you know, between careful selection of um, our capture microphone and, and the uh, reproduction um, speaker, we were able to get past that immediately. And then of course we took that to a much, much deeper level um, eventually with, with the folks at Harman and using using their expertise and uh, in their anechoic chambers. And, you know, so put a lot more kind of rigor around that uh, testing process. Yeah, so our first step was proving it to ourselves mm -hmm. that a vocal reamp cap, you know, we call it bottling, bottling the source with a, with a high resolution capture microphone, right? And then I think of it as, as like um, suspending time, because if, if you can capture a vocal performance or any acoustic performance um, in a way where there's no artifacts added, um, it's, it's true to the source, store that in Pro Tools, and then just wait and hold on to it until a moment where you can re-sing it. Through a loudspeaker so in our initial test it was actually surprisingly yeah. convincing and so we knew that even if that's as far as we went we would have a consistent source right. to sing into all of these microphones but of course we wanted it to be we wanted it to not just to be a consistent source but we wanted and we needed audio test kitchen for the user to be just as if a real live vocalist was singing into these mics and, and we just kept pushing ourselves until we got there but as you pointed out we um, we realized we didn't possess the technical ability or the facilities to go from that 90 plus percent mark of convincingness all the way. Right. Um, and so really it was, it was um, you know, sometimes um, what you will <laughs> into existence um, can come true if you just keep working on it. And so what we willed into existence was um, that a place like Harman Laboratories, which is local to us in Los Angeles, might take interest in what we're doing and might share their anechoic chambers and share some of their their knowledge and their scientific method to help us close that last five or 10% gap. And we were really fortunate that um, we actually uh, got in front of them um, because you know they're busy scientists and, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it proved over the course of the year, a year that we tried to reach out to them and find them that um, uh, it, was, it was hard to get their attention. Finally, the timing was right. We're in front of them. We made a quick pitch and uh, they said to us, hey, you know, this seems like a really interesting problem and we're interested in helping you. So Harman helped us ultimately through the use of their anechoic chambers for mm -hmm. capturing um, acoustic sources, vocals, acoustic guitar, totally artifact free, mm -hmm. and then being able to analyze the differences between here's a live vocal and here's one that we're reamplifying, reproducing. What are the differences and can we just null them out? Right. And that's ultimately what we did. And so at the end of the day on Audio Test Kitchen, um, the vocals that we're reproducing through uh, a capture, a Shep's capture mic and a DPA capture mic, an Atom studio monitor and an ATC studio monitor um, were indistinguishable in blind tests from the live vocal. Well, so let's talk about uh, drums first because that was kind of a, you know, how are we going to, uh, you, you know, capture drums um, and keep them consistent and keep them consistent over time. <laughs> and, and, and you're so, a drummer. Yeah. So I, I started out as a drummer uh, and, you know, I, you know, I, I had some suspicions that, you know, just like with vocalists that even the best drummer, you know, it, you know, is going to, is going to, you know, hit that kick drum a little bit, you know, with a little bit more authority, you know, and, you know, take one versus, and we're talking about 300, takes here right you know well across multiple songs you're you know 1200 
different kick drums. And it's just, you know, I, I just had real suspicions about whether that was going to be, um, those variables were able to be managed. So ultimately- And, and, and me as an engineer and you yeah. as an engineer, you know, we've both been in the studio a lot having to tune the drums ourselves. Like yeah. I, I love actually tuning tuning drums as an engineer in the yeah. studio. And I realized that even, even the subtlest turn of, of a lug can create a big difference. Like it might get rid of a rattle right. or it might create a different sympathetic relationship between the two heads, which produces a different resonance. So, and also though, drums are like some of our favorite instruments. Yeah. So we wanted to get it right. You know, we wanted to yeah. make sure that the sound of the drums on all these mics was cool Yep. and compelling. So we were committed to working with acoustic drums. Totally. From yeah, the beginning. From, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, if you break it down to the variables, you've got your performance. And the, so the performance variable, we really ultimately settled on um, for most of the instruments, uh, the, the drum instruments, they're really drum robots. So we, you know, reached out to a company um, called uh, uh, Poly Polyend, End, yeah. which makes a, 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 something called the Perk, which is um, a solenoid, you know, a MIDI controlled solenoid that will strike, you know, a drum or a cymbal with the exact same, um, with the exact same amount of force each time. And, you know, it's really, really super consistent. And so we wound up, uh, you know, getting a bunch of these from that company. Um, so that's what actually strikes the drums that you're hearing in most, in most cases, the, the hi-hat, the tambourine, um, the snare drum initially. Um, and so that was managing, that was managing the performance uh, variable there. Did well, you say bass drum? I did, yeah. yeah, yeah. I did say. I, <laughs> I know. I left out bass drum because we started. We we tried to use it on bass drum initially. Um, so, uh, but ultimately, we had to uh, had to have a plan B, right? Uh, which oh, there are uh, lots of plan B. Yeah, there's it's maybe C. yeah plan B to maybe F. <laughs> I think yeah. And so, F yeah, you, sometimes you, stands for fail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, we thought, hey, we love drums. Let's uh, let's record a drum kit at one of the best drum recording rooms on the planet, truly. I mean, you can, lots of people can make that claim, but East West Studio 2, known as yeah. uh, the Rick Rubin room and uh, Beach Boys and all that, it's an amazing sounding room acoustically for yeah. drums and live bands, rock bands, R really renowned for that. So we got um, LA's, <clears throat> one of LA's most renowned drum techs, Ross <laughs> Garfield, the drum doctor, to come in and set up this beautiful vintage kit. We had um, our perk on, on the snare drum, perk on the kick drum, perk on the hi-hat. So a little three-piece kit in the sweet spot in the room, had it all tuned up and playing. Sounded amazing. Sounded amazing. And it's like, whoa, we can really do this. And to keep uh, variables consistent with the mics, we, we put one mic in front of that kit in kind of the close position, laser aligned it, put one a few feet away in more of the room position, exactly where the East-West engineers recommended. Yeah. And we proceeded to, over the course of five days, really <laughs> cross our fingers and pray well, it wasn't just prayer we, we were we were monitoring along the way right we had we had control mics set up the entire time so we would we would yeah. listen between mics and compare to the to the first take and go oh well you know as the tuning would change with the mic with, with a snare drum we would we'd have to stop everything and go back and tune and this happened periodically or yeah. if temperature fluctuated at all you know things things would things would would tweak and so we would have to go back and spend Anywhere from five minutes to hours, you know, trying to get those drums uh, back in, you know, back in line with the original so that there wasn't any kind of tuning performance. Um, but just to pick up where you left off, ultimately we got to about day five at East West and uh, and we, you know, had, took a step back. We were listening to these. Yeah, we, we hit another point where I think it was the snare drum at that point had gone out or no, it was actually the hi-hat. Surprisingly enough, the hi hat was just not sounding the same. So if you think about the you know the hi hat mechanism and the the pressure, you know, um, you know, uh, you know that kind of choking mechanism and all the different kind of variables, even that go into a hi hat, um, it was it, it was not sounding the same, and 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 neither was I think neither was the snare drum, and we were trying to get the tuning back to the point where where it was originally. And uh, we just could not quite get it there. And so we took a step back, listened over the course of the five days of recording um, at great expense and ultimately made the decision that like, this is not working. This is not good enough. It sounds great. You can clearly hear the characteristics of the microphones coming through, um, but but it didn't just doesn't hold up to the level of scrutiny um, that, that we were uh, that we were uh, okay with. So we ultimately scrapped 
all of that and moved and moved fo moved forward to a to a, a different instrument and uh, had to come back to do it again. And and to be specific about mm -hmm. some of the things we were hearing, you know, the we had these hand hammered symbols mm -hmm. from Istanbul, and uh, if the relationship, the the difference in rotation between the top hat hat and the bottom hat changed, the fundamental pitch of the hi hats would change sure. from like a like ch -ch to ch -ch 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 -ch. and just that little difference there is enough to make someone, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. potentially falsely attribute yeah. a difference in sound to a difference in microphone from, you know, if we record the, you know, uh, AT5040, you know, and it's sounding like ch -ch, and then we record the AT5047 uh, and it's, ch -ch, you know, yeah. they're going to think, oh, that's the Dark sound of that mic. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's not the case. So little things all the little things mattered when we were yeah. making content and to such a, a, an extent that, I mean, we, um, we, we go into the studio, we did this multiple times. We went into the studio expecting like, okay, we're going to get it, you know? And, and, uh, ultimately some of the sessions that we invested a lot of time in, you know, we hauled all the microphones there. We hired a crew to do it, um, booked the time. Um, we had to, to, uh, chalk those sessions up to essentially R and D, you know, learning, le you know, learning lessons uh, at great, great expense. And the only good takeaway from that was, um, you know, through our commitment to eliminate all variables from the source, um, we did over time learn to control variables in, in these, these things that are, were, you know, we had to go into wrestling matches yeah. with. So how do we uh, control these variables at the end? Um, so let's use the hi hat for example, um, as Alex was describing. You know the relationship; everything matters in hi hat. There's so many variables. You think it's just a symbol; it's metal. How how can it really sound that differently? It might be one of the more easy drums to to manage. Well, there's there's the top symbol and your bottom symbol. There's that. How much do you choke the top symbol? How much is the bottom symbol choked, if it is at all? What's the pressure relationship? Is is this top hat spinning, where is it being struck uh, by the stick? Um, and so we ultimately wound up having to uh, construct a couple of different um, new type of hi-hat stands um, that used that used uh, consistent pressure utilizing weights. And um, we, con con you know, so basically we, we, we had to custom fabricate uh, a hi-hat stand that allowed us to kind of manage all, all of these variables. And so through trial and error, we were ultimately able to get to the place where um, nothing was moving, where the right right amount of pressure was was there consistent over multiple days, um, where we could take it apart and put it back together if we needed to. Um, and uh, and the results were were like dead on. So um, ultimately that, that was that was a success. It's it's really spooky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um and I, you know, so you're creating your own hi hat robot. It's kind of exciting, right? <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, Perk made the thing that actually strikes it, but everything else we we built, and um, we even built a little anti spin mechanism. I right. remember that. That's we got a, we got a patent that the hi hat anti spin mechanism, um, or anti spin pin. Right. So um, what we realized um, in recording any of the drums or any of the sources was that you literally have to control all variables. Of within that thing, so nothing can move. And um, one of the things that helped us was, for example, using Latch Lake stands. Um, mm -hmm. They're really heavy-duty mic stands that we could um, lock into a very specific position and just knew it would never move because nothing can ever move. And so it was spooky about um, finally being victorious with um, our our um, hi hat robot and our tambourine robot. Um, was that we would comp we'd always compare take one. So whether it was past two or past 22 or past 122, it would always be referenced back to take one, microphone number one, because they all had to match. And so it was really spooky over the course of a week because it would ultimately take us a week to record each individual instrument when all was going well. So hi-hat, you know, comparing, comparing um, over such a broad period of time and having at at 5:30 p.m. on Friday sound identical to the way it sounded at 10 a.m. on Monday yeah. was just bizarre yeah. and very satisfying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So for piano, we managed variables by using a Yamaha Disclavier. So I was lucky enough that I have a small version of a Disclavier at home that I'd actually never even hooked up the Disclavier mechanism 
to it. Uh, but so step one is we had to figure out like, can you really use this, uh, this, this instrument um, in a way so as to capture a performance, a real human performance, you know, in MIDI, and then will it, will it reproduce that performance consistently enough over time? You know, so clearly you, you know, just claviers are built so that they can play some pre-recorded MIDI, but- Which you know, I think is generally Liberace, right? Right, yeah, but it's all Chopin or whatever, like, you know, kind of, you know, uh, show tunes or, you know, or holiday music. And, um, and one thing driving this, if mm-hmm. I can interrupt, is, mm-hmm. um, our desire to have as many acoustic sources yeah, as right. possible. Yeah. So we, we kind of surveyed, you know, the world of instruments and, and thought, okay, well, you know, it's commonplace to reproduce, to reamplify electric bass, electric guitar. Those are things yeah. people are using to plug in direct. Totally common studio practice. Okay, what about for piano? Oh, yeah. well, there's this thing that already exists that kind of is the piano robot. Right. So uh, we, we, we had it one literally under our fingertips. Yeah. So we were able to do some pre pre production, you know, on on my own to figure out. Oh yeah, cool. You can really, you know, make a performance. And then the question was, okay, how consistent are those performances? And it turns out like very like enorm crazy consistent. Um, so we're like, great. Um, do we want to use my smaller player piano from Yamaha? You know, let's see if we can we can connect and partner with with uh, Yamaha. They're local here in LA, so they were nice enough to to see what we were trying to do and lend us their you know their latest greatest uh, um, uh, C7 version of their of their uh, of their Disclavier, and it was beautiful. So at East, we brought that into East West, and we wound up, um, uh, you know. Among other things, having a tuner come back at least twice a day to keep that piano in tune when we were doing all those all those piano takes. So, um, so that was that was mostly a success, I think, from the get go. You know, as far you know, the, the first time. Right? Yeah, and and it actually gave us an opportunity to follow through with a recommendation that many of the microphone manufacturers gave us. For example, Josephson. Um, as they uh, considered sending us their microphones to uh, to participate in Audio Test Kitchen, their main concern and one of the best aspects of Josephson microphones, you know, all these companies kind of have different design goals in mind. And one of their design goals is that the off-axis response is free of coloration and is going to contribute positively to the, the sound of the microphone, even if you're sort of focusing directly on what's in front of it. So that got our wheels turning thinking about, okay, well, what kinds of situations can we put these microphones in where they are going to pick up the off-axis sound? So here we have this, you know, beautiful, large, you know, acoustic grand piano in the middle of East West Live Room. Of course, we're going to put a microphone near it or in it, and we put it under the, the, the lid in a really beautiful spot. But then we put a microphone way back in the room as well that was then picking up, you know, that bloom and representing, helping to represent the off-axis response as well. And in fact, when I think about it, you know, a piano is a great instrument too for... um, in that it's the way that the sound comes off of it Mm -hmm. is is not only omnidirectional, but it, it comes off in so many different ways, like different, you know, you can move a microphone an inch under a piano and like different overtones really come shooting out. So actually even our close mic placement under this uh, under the hood of this acoustic piano was um, really telling a story about mm-hmm. the off-axis response of these microphones as well. Sure. Yeah. One of the most surprising things I learned about going through this three-year journey now to launch Audio Test Kitchen with one category of gear was uh, that everything takes three times as long as you want it to, <laughs> and it's three times more expensive. And uh, <laughs> there will just be challenges that you cannot anticipate. So um, the thing that I, I say, try to say to myself, and I would say to anybody out there who is considering, you know, uh, following through on a vision of any scale, is um, when you hit obstacles, just just figure out a way to keep going. You know, take a breath, uh, phone a friend, uh, talk to people, uh, have an advisor, um, and uh, and just oftentimes when it was when we were at our lowest points or things seem most challenging because we definitely had moments of, of failure that, you know, fortunately we were able to turn into really important lessons that told us, that instructed us, well, what what should the next step be? And and because we kept going and because we kept putting it out there and, and, and trusting that this was an important thing to do, this was an important problem to solve, um, we, uh, we had a lot of breakthroughs. Uh, so those obstacles, ultimately represented opportunities. So looking back, I would say the thing that surprised me the most was 
uh, the mm. number of those kind of near failure moments that we were able to change into um, in, into breakthroughs. Yeah. So what was most surprising to me, I'll, I'll talk about two things. One um, was that the, so we what were talking about some of these, these processes that we employed, but we're really only scratching the surface here. I mean, there was so much that we did all along the way to, to try and solve this problem the right way, the, as, as, you know, as no one has really gone on it before. And so all of these, these, these steps along the path were subjected to, to such scrutiny by us. And I think I'm surprised at how little scrutiny has been placed on our process from users to date. I mean, there's certainly some, and people want to dig in and ask how you did this. Um, but I, we kind of braced ourselves for this kind of overwhelming uh, uh, tidal wave of just how can you do this and what is this and what's the for you know and really so it's the exact signal chain you totally let us under the hood yeah and there's a little bit of that and and we we're really happy to 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 uh, to, to to have those conversations um, but really it was re really far less than we thought and it really ultimately the I think the community of users were just really so so um, so grateful to have this this uh, resource available to them. Um, that uh, that uh, yeah, they were they were less uh, less concerned about about that, uh, but there's a lot of really really you know there's a lot that that went into it that you know um, that we haven't even touched on. Um, so that's number one, and then I think number two from a business perspective, we weren't really sure um, who among the stakeholders, aside from the users, how everyone else was going to respond to this, you know, how are, how are manufacturers going to respond when we reached out to them? Were they going to be receptive to the idea of sending us their gear and letting us, um, letting us use it and compare it and host it on our platform for everyone to listen to? How are they going to respond to our processes? Um, how are retailers going to respond? And really, um, in a nutshell, the, the, the level of support among the, the audio community has just been really overwhelming you know including obviously sound on sound and but but from the get-go you know I think everyone recognized um, that this was a problem to be solved and there was really none of this um, kind of you know protective uh, feeling coming from really any manufacturers or any retailers and so the, the support's really been you know been was was a really really uh, pleasant surprise when you dig in on a project of this scale and and you spend so much time and, and energy putting into it, you really have to cross your fingers at a lot during a lot of the course of actually executing it and making it through the the, the various um, challenges. And that whole time, what are you crossing your fingers for? You're just hoping that when you finally launch, that people will see the value in solving this problem, the same value that you saw. Yes, this problem needed to be solved, and so. Fortunately, and the, the best reaction that we've gotten, and the reason I put it in the category of we are surprised by it is because you never know. You, you don't know if, how people are going to respond. But fortunately, um, the response has been simply, this is amazing. This is obvious. This should have existed a long time ago. And what are you doing next? If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.